Okay, here's a question. What did people call first-person shooters before they called them first-person shooters? Now, you might be thinking, quite fairly, that FPS as a genre name and a broad description of a type of game is kind of a no-brainer, right? They're games where you shoot, and they're in first-person. What other possible name could you need? Well, for half a decade, from 1993 all the way up to around the year 2000, the predominant terminology for a game where you shoot in first person wasn't first person shooter, but Doom clone. It seems bizarre now, but back in the day, id Software's Doom was so popular that it was basically the sole definition for the early FPS genre, and almost every other proto-first person shooter was ultimately inspired by and judged relative to Doom. It was that all-encompassing even if it wasn't actually the first FPS. Everything from Blood to Quake and all the terrible knockoffs in between, basically every shooter from that era was to a greater or lesser degree, more or less just Doom with different graphics and levels. It wasn't just that shooters not similar to Doom wouldn't sell, although that was definitely true, it's that Doom had such a massive cultural presence that games that didn't follow its template felt almost wrong. And it wasn't until Half-Life came out, coincidentally at around the same time Doom clone as a term started falling off, that the FPS genre as a whole was finally able to move out of Doom's shadow, and even then, Half-Life still has Doom's health systems, a comparable weapon toolkit, and even a similar setting and plot. That's just how influential Doom was, and how widespread cloning it became. Now, the idea that the original Doom is an important piece of video gaming history probably isn't very surprising, so why am I talking about this weird piece of 20th century trivia that started before I was even born? Well, it's because in the modern day, where there are an ever-increasing number of games coming out every year, and there's an extra three decades of history to draw from, cloned video games that copy an existing title are more prevalent and influential than ever before. Roguelikes and Metroidvanias, for example, mainstays of the indie scene, are two enduringly popular genres that are primarily based around endless mimicry of a single highly influential title, Rogue and Super Metroid, respectively. In the AAA space, practically everyone is trying to flat out have a second go at their old titles and give them a fresh spin, and the industry as a whole is still reeling from many, many failed attempts to copy the big multiplayer heavy hitters of Overwatch, Fortnite, and Minecraft, all three of which are themselves blatant clones of existing games. If you look closely enough at the modern-day gaming ecosystem, you will see almost nothing but clones. And from this, it's easy to come to the conclusion that we've entered a dark age of creatively bankrupt repetition. 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 However, I'm not convinced that's actually what's happening. While some copied games absolutely are transparent, lazy attempts to cash in on the hard work of someone else, or to blindly chase a trend, clones also serve a valuable role in the greater artistic ecosystem of the medium. And not only that, they've been around since the very beginning of video games. While sequels can take some of the credit for pushing video games forwards, I think the true engine that drives the progress of the medium lies in clones, whether made by the same studio as the original, or by a completely different third party. It's only by understanding the important role that clones play, and learning how to distinguish a good, useful clone from a bad, pointless one, that we can understand why clones need to exist, and why some games that seem like total rip-offs can manage to feel fresh and unique, whereas others that go out of their way to seem different end up feeling like you've already played before. Nowhere is the tricky and sometimes unintuitive nature of video game clones more apparent than in the case of Souls-likes, another genre defined by a single video game series that a bunch of people have tried to replicate with pretty limited success. Just in 2023, and only considering larger games, we've had Jedi Survivor, Lords of the Fallen, Remnant 2, and Lies of P, all games which could be very generously called homages to the works of FromSoft, each one featuring bonfires, recharging healing, stamina management, an emphasis on big boss fights, and non-linear level design. Each one of these games knowingly and obviously rip off the FromSoft catalogue of games, with most of them trying to add their own twist. Remnant has its huge focus on ranged combat, Jedi Survivor is all about simplified cinematic Star Warsing, and Lords of the Fallen has its very creative two worlds mechanics. The only one of these games that doesn't really have its own standout gimmick is Lies of P, a game I found to be incredibly derivative of Bloodborne. Lies of P steals everything from Bloodborne's aggressive health recovery, to its absence of shields, and even a lot of its enemy designs. Hell, a lot of the environments look pretty damn similar, as do both games' obligatory level-up waifu dolls. The only thing Lies of P doesn't steal from Bloodborne is its parrying system, and that's just nicked from Sekiro. 
However, in spite of this blatant plagiarism, Liza P was the only one of 2023's FromSoft clones that I ended up sticking with, and crucially, the only one I didn't spend my entire playtime with unfavorably comparing to the proper Souls games, even though it reminded me the most of them. And I think the reason why this is, is that while Lies of P certainly isn't an original game, it's the only one that uses its status as a clone to its full potential. So, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I think the clones needn't be mere echoes of the games they copy. By using their position as clones to their advantage, many can stand shoulder to shoulder with their inspirations, and sometimes even surpass them, with the very best clones eventually shedding the label of clone entirely. If you ask me, the secret to a well-designed clone like Lies of P relies on understanding the idea that much like in any good sci-fi, while a clone might begin life as a simple copy, it will invariably develop a personality all of its own. And truly great clones embrace this fact rather than trying to stifle it. Look at a lot of retro, nostalgia-based clones, for example, which often have a nasty habit of sticking too closely to their inspiration. Learning to chop off enemy limbs in the Callisto Protocol isn't anywhere near as fun when you've already done it in Dead Space and when you're missing your iconic plasma cutter. And Atomic Heart's knock-off Bioshock combat was pretty simplistic when I first saw it 15 years ago, and me already knowing all the overpower combos in advance has not done the format any favours. All too many developers of clone games, as well as players looking for more of the same, make the critical error of assuming that just because we like the original game, we'll automatically like something that's similar just as much. While this is certainly true to an extent, ultra-faithful clones often end up fighting a losing battle against our nostalgia. Wargroove is, with one or two small exceptions, literally just advanced wars with a fantasy skin, and Ukulele is a faithful clone of Banjo-Kazooie, complete with bad minigames and boring bosses. But the problem with these games is that people don't have nostalgia for Wargroove and Ukulele like they do for Advance Wars and Banjo-Kazooie, and so because these clones do nothing new and make no attempt to distinguish themselves, there's virtually no reason to pick them over the originals. Instead of being a slave to the memory of a clone's inspiration, the best clones looking to forge their own path instead leverage these inevitable comparisons to highlight their uniqueness without giving up on the advantages of a player's existing familiarity. Shovel Knight is the obvious king of this. It borrows extensively from games like DuckTales, Mega Man, and Castlevania, but it always makes sure to never directly reference them, and instead let fans experience the same ideas through the lens of some different gameplay styles, creating that warm feeling of familiarity without going head-to-head -head with any specific nostalgia. On the flip side, The Great Gravity Circuit directly references Mega Man X several times, both in visual style and by reusing some iconic Mega Man level design. However, the game only makes these comparisons when it's sure they can be used to highlight just how different Gravity Circuit's flexible, fast-paced movement mechanics are from its inspiration, creating a clear point of comparison in Gravity Circuit's favour while still giving the game a nice nostalgic boost. This necessity of taking into account a player's existing level of familiarity also applies to more contemporaneous clones too. Look at any number of the seemingly endless clones of any popular indie game, like, I don't know, Vampire Survivors or Stardew Valley. As much as I might have liked Soulstone Survivors, a Vampire Survivors clone, or Coral Island, a slavish Stardew Valley clone, what little new stuff these games added to the formula simply wasn't enough to keep my attention because I'd already seen all their tricks before and had essentially already mastered them before I'd even started playing. This was an issue I also ran into with Jedi Survivor, as well as its prequel, Fallen Order. The games make great use of Souls-like fundamentals to make exploration tense and fights nice and satisfying. Unfortunately, because the games really don't do all that much new beyond the obvious Star Wars aesthetic, particularly when it comes to combat, I couldn't help but slip into Souls-like routine and get bored of the battles very quickly because the games were completely unable to surprise me. A recurring boss fight against the guy who's all about big combo strings and magic that you've got to get good at parrying? Yep. I've seen him before, he's in Sekiro. That guy getting replaced by another similar guy who you thought was good towards the end of the game, who uses the same weapon but now he also has a gun, uh, weirdly enough, I've also seen that one before, also in Sekiro, as it happens. For the record, the Jedi games are actually really good, but because I've already played Sekiro and Dark Souls, and the games just don't do enough to justify their relationship outside of this comparison, to me, they'll only ever be a slightly more ambitious than normal clone. A clone establishing a unique identity isn't just a matter of being different from the game it's based on, though. It also needs to define itself within a wider cultural context. Phrased less pretentiously, what that means is that clones, by virtue of being similar to something that people already know, are going to come pre-baked with some existing expectations from its source material. And a failure to take these into account can end up meaning that a clone will be unable to escape comparisons to its inspiration. Chasm and Sundered, for example, 
two Metroidvanias try to shake up the format by having randomly generated worlds instead of fixed ones. However, this ruins the exploration centric gameplay the fans of Metroid games like and expect, meaning that no matter how good these games are and how different they may have tried to be, they're always going to be associated with being a Metroid clone because they cloned Metroid so badly that it's impossible to escape. On the other hand, Hollow Knight manages to stand out by hitting all the requisite Metroid cornerstones from exploration to movement enhancing traversal abilities, but doing so in a way that feels uniquely visceral and epic compared to the relatively subdued original Metroid games, giving the game a unique identity but within a framework that people expect. Many of the most well known and most successful clones of all owe their success not to bold flashes of uniqueness, but simply to the fact that they excel at reinterpreting the expectations of their source material in a new and interesting way, enriching and distinguishing both games through the comparison. The excellent Chance of Senna, for example, is heavily inspired by the equally good Heaven's Vault, with both games being about deciphering alien languages using broadly the same mechanics. However, Chance of Senna opts for being a pure puzzler rather than a narratively focused adventure game, and this difference serves to contrast the two games while still providing the same kind of fun. And the new Final Fantasy VII games could have been a straight up remake, but instead they take the bold step of being kind of a commentary on the original game, staying true to their cinematic roots whilst also providing a new, more action centric perspective on the same ideas, meaning that both games retain their own unique identity and you can get more out of one by playing the other to see what's different. For example, the ending of the remake is considerably more incomprehensibly batshit insane. By deliberately playing off elements of their source material that everyone expects, clones can take control of the cultural narrative that they were invariably going to be a part of anyway, and in doing so, carve out their own place within it. Hades, for example, reinterprets the core loop of endless death in a roguelike into the foundation for a completely linear and consistent narrative that spans multiple runs, and Desktop Dungeons reduces the same concepts to their absolute fundamentals and in doing so becomes kind of a resource management puzzler. By the same token, Slipways clearly riffs off of the gameplay loop of classic Space Forex games like Master of Orion but cuts out all the combat, creating the same kind of experience but from a different point of view that couldn't exist without the original games. Conversely, many titles that fail to really meet the expectations of their predecessors or fit into the conversation ultimately end up failing as clones before they've even really gotten started. Humankind, as a clone of civilization, fails to give people the fun of historical roleplay with its ever shifting factions, and so regardless of its merits as a game, this missing piece always stands out over everything else. And Starbound failed as a clone of Terraria because despite copying the core gameplay, stretching the premise over multiple planets could never be as compelling as getting to explore a single ever changing world over a long period of time. This is kind of related to the problem I have with Remnant from the Ashes. It's a game that goes for the interesting gimmick of a Souls like with ranged combat and design influences from looty shooty games like Destiny. Unfortunately, though, the missing elements of its inspiration ultimately hamstring the result. Because Remnant is all about shooty bang bang guns, enemies fail to feel anywhere near as satisfyingly lethal as in a Souls game because you can easily kill most before they can even react to you. The only way Remnant can make enemies remotely threatening is to make them huge bullet sponges that just run at you, or to have them spam loads of AoEs you need to run away from, neither of which are very fun things to do while trying to shoot. Equally, because the game borrows randomly generated environments from elsewhere, with the areas and dungeons appearing in a random order, Remnant's locales don't feel as if they fit together cohesively as part of a single journey to mastery like they do in other Souls-likes, leading to them all just being kind of generic and forgettable with no distinct identity or sense of progression. Remnant's visuals, setting and ideas are all great, but its failure to be a good Souls-like on a fundamental level means that I can't help but wish that it wasn't inspired by Dark Souls at all, which is, let's be honest, never a position you want a clone to be in. This brings me on to my final key point about clones, and that's that the best ones don't just attempt to distinguish themselves from their inspiration, but to supersede it, forming part of a genre-wide back and forth that leads to constant advancement and change as various clones all try to one-up each other. This is how FPS games freed themselves from comparisons to Doom. Each of Doom's clones try to improve upon it in different ways, adding better gunplay, or exploration, or a story, and gradually these clones, such as Half-Life, became so good and so popular that they became the new standard, inspiring a new generation of clones, all connected by their shared design lineage rather than them all being copies of the same thing. And many other clones 
have seen similar success. There are a whole host of indie games that exist pretty much just as versions of existing games, but designed for veterans who are already familiar with the gameplay. The likes of Demon Crawl and Let's Revolution are more advanced takes on Minesweeper for people who've gotten bored of the classic version. Ultra hardcore extraction games are for people desensitised to mainstream battle royales and who are in need of a stronger hit of the same stuff, and intricate strategy and management games like Battle Brothers and City Skylines assume an existing familiarity with the titans of the genre they're based on and are thus free to really push the boat out in terms of difficulty and complexity that simply wouldn't be possible in a title targeting a mass audience of relative newbies. City Skylines in particular was literally greenlit after Paradox saw the oversimplified SimCity 2013 crash and burn because series veterans wanted something more complex than the originals, not less. Additionally, Rather than making a direct improvement or follow-up to an existing game, some clones stand out by copying not a whole title or a collection of titles, but just one small part, expanding it into a sort of pruned cutting of the original game. Disco Elysium, for example, is very heavily inspired by Planescape Torment, but removes all of the superfluous combat and a lot of the Dungeons & Dragons baggage to focus purely on narrative RPG storytelling. Of course, some clones of this type are made with a little bit less love and a lot more spite. There's a whole subgenre of indie games out there made by fans of Sonic who've had enough with Sega and have tried to make the Sonic game they've always wanted for themselves, one with no gimmicks and none of Sonic's stupid friends. Spark the Electric Jester 3 is one of the better known ones, taking the Sonic and Shadow sections of Sonic Adventure 2, which were like a quarter of that game, and blowing them up to be the whole experience. Now, with the time and space they need to breathe, these gameplay concepts can finally be put to good use, unburdened by the Knuckles treasure hunt bits interrupting my fun. Not all clones manage to justify their existence by improving upon or altering their inspirations though. There are a great many which take bold swings and end up totally failing to succeed what came before them. A lot of the would-be contenders to the Smash Bros crown ultimately failed to make a dent in its reputation because while they were serviceable fighting games in their own right, they lacked the sheer variety and depth offered by the original that makes it such a great competitive game, even if Nintendo wish it wasn't. Equally, Back for Blood tried to add an extra layer of complexity and replayability to Left 4 Dead by adding a bunch of progression systems and variant enemies to what was otherwise the same concept, but in doing so, it ended up polluting the purity that makes Left 4 Dead work. Suddenly, it was impossible to tell at a glance how a particular enemy was going to attack you, and gameplay became much more about optimising your deck of buff cards outside the game than clever team play and efficient shooting, spoiling what was once a very focused experience. Unfortunately, Lords of the Fallen, one of our Souls-likes, falls into this same trap. It introduces a load of new gimmicks to spice up the Dark Souls formula, but it quickly becomes apparent that this stuff was absent in FromSoft's games for a reason. Making your own bonfire sounds cool, but because you can't see what's coming, you either make too many and the game's too easy, or too few and it's too hard. The same goes for the game's Umbral Mirror World. It's visually cool and leads to some interesting puzzles, but it necessitates a load of really tiresome wandering around in both worlds, and the infinitely respawning baddies in the Umbral World mess with the delicate pacing of the areas. Lords of the Fallen also tries to up the ante on Dark Souls by having more traps, but uh... How do I put this? When every box, corner and item has a dude behind it waiting to spring out at you, in a sense, none of them do. Really, when it comes right down to it, clones that stand out are the ones that eventually stop being clones at all, and the ones that fail to stick in your memory and distinguish themselves exist as static cultural objects, rather than as part of an ever-evolving dialogue. This is why I absolutely love Lies of P, in spite of its lack of enemy variety, linearity, and general lack of original ideas. Whoa, is that a poison swamp? It doesn't just feel like a game made by people who play Bloodborne and thought, yeah, I like that and I want more, so I'll do it again. It feels like a game made by people who played Bloodborne and thought, yeah, that was good, but we can do better. So much of Lies of P is a direct reaction to what the Souls likes, changing and improving upon their systems in a way that aren't just for the better, but also serve to give the game its own unique feel. Bloodborne's combat is pretty simplistic and spammy, don't correct me in the comments, so Lies of P adds a bunch of cool new moves you can do to bring fights to a satisfying conclusion like each weapon's unique charge moves. The game also goes out of its way to fix a lot of long-standing quality of life issues, like removing the necessity of farming healing items, telling you where NPC quests are on the map, and giving you a customizable, rechargeable weapon buff, so no more having to save them forever and never ending up using them. The game even lets you customize your gear, with the weapon's handle determining its scaling, moveset, and one of its abilities, and the blade determining its damage, elemental type, and the other special move. It's a super cool system with loads of depth, and I absolutely love it, to the point that that my only real wish for it is for FromSoft to steal it and put it in one of
of their games. It's that good. And that's also kind of the point of clones, right? Almost every good video game, in fact, probably almost every game period, began life as a clone. Inspiration doesn't just appear from thin air, it comes from how we experience existing media, how we react to it, respond to it, and want to improve upon it. Creating an ever-shifting cultural landscape of clones that become fixtures in of themselves, which in turn spawn more clones that will in time replace them. And rather than being a generic platitude to excuse lazy copying, this fundamental fact of all art is a reminder that clones need to be done well and have their own voice, otherwise they're not fulfilling their purpose. This is why I've tried to be fair to all the Souls likes that I wasn't as much of a fan of, because while I don't think most of them are particularly great, the bold choices and changes they make can serve as lessons to games that follow in their footsteps and might even serve as inspirations to future titles that refine their raw potential. And in that way, they are just as valuable a clone as Lies of Peers. This is also why many big budget games' insistence on endlessly dragging in a million games and mechanics into a single amorphous clone blob frustrate me so much. The endless open world kitchen sinks like Starfield, Hogwarts Legacy and Ubisoft's entire catalogue are clones of everything and so have nothing to say and present nothing to react to. In many ways, these utterly unambitious and derivative clones, whose sole aim is to do nothing new and challenge or comment on as little as possible, are worse than merely being bad games, as they actively serve to bog down the advancement and progression of their genre and give a bad name to clones that don't. Without clones that tried to build on what came before them in small but significant ways, evolving the medium and learning lessons with every step, we'd still think Doom was the best Wolfenstein clone ever, and FromSoft would still be making Kingsfield games. If we deify one particular game or way of making games too much and fail to acknowledge challenges to the throne, then genres we love can risk stagnating and wallowing in their own history instead of dynamically evolving over time. Because, let's be honest, all the games we think are unimpeachable tentpoles made to be imitated are definitely all clones themselves. Similarly, Call of Duty wouldn't exist without Medal of Honor, World of Warcraft wouldn't exist without EverQuest, and Slay the Spire wouldn't exist without DreamQuest. None of these games are unique, and none of them will stick around forever. And that's okay. Hell, some of them have already been replaced by clones. And as a final note, this philosophy is especially true for making things as well as consuming media. The only way to get started as an artist creating anything is to first create a clone and then come up with its individual identity later by reacting to and building off from your inspiration. Disney's classics are all just adapted folk stories, Shakespeare himself said imitation is the greatest form of flattery, and even this YouTube channel started life as me doing a really terrible Game Maker's Toolkit slash sequelitis impression. Sure, it didn't start sucking slightly less until I came up with a perspective and voice that was a bit more unique, but that couldn't have happened without first finding my footing as a copycat. So in conclusion, yes, clones are everywhere, yes, there are more of them every day, and yes, most of them sort of suck. But without clones, video games wouldn't be the vibrant, varied medium they are today, and they may very well not exist at all. The important thing to remember is that the only way to stop lazy, creatively bankrupt clones from smothering everything else is for us to spot the few that have something interesting to say, genuine passion behind them, or just some cool ideas worth stealing, and give them the attention and publicity they deserve so that they too can one day inspire some new clones. Just, uh, word to the wise, don't try and copy this channel because um, then people will find out that almost anyone could do it better than me, and I I can't I can't do a real job. Uh, please don't take this away from me. I'm 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 begging you, please. I I I need money to buy crisps. Hello and welcome to this a special holiday after the video special. Ho 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 etc. Don't worry, I'm hard at work on the end of year video, I just thought that I'd bash this one out in the meantime while I'm still compiling my final list and narrowing it down from the 80 odd it was at the start. Oof. Anyway, this is the part of every video where I shout out some cool people that you need to be paying attention to and talk about why they're so great. And this time, I'd like to point you in the direction of Maraganga, a video essayist with the self-styled tagline of Style is Substance. And if that doesn't tell you all about the kind of game she covers, then nothing else will. Maraganga specialises in weird, surreal realist and, most importantly, gorgeous games that you've probably never heard of, and explains why that in spite of the fact that almost nothing she talks about has ever come close to commercial success, these games and their offbeat messages are still worth attention and appreciation, in many parts because of their incompatibility with mainstream video game design. Maraganga is great, please check her out. 
And I can't mention the benefits of incompatibility with the mainstream without mentioning my wonderful patrons. Do you enjoy me having the freedom to relentlessly slag off big budget video games that would much rather I say nice things about them in exchange for money? Well, thanks to the support of my wonderful patrons, I don't have to take it. Independent games criticism is more important than ever before, now that we're in the age of Jeff Keighley and the bleh, Game Awards, and so it's been a privilege to be able to do it for all you people for as long as I have. And apologies, but I have no intention of stopping anytime soon. And if you're interested in supporting me and joining my beautiful, intelligent, and thoroughly overflattered patrons, you'll even get some cool bonus content in return, like early access to videos, extra bits of game design goodness, behind the scenes stuff, and even your name in the credits. With my very special $10 a month patrons, getting a voiced shout out as a very special reward. And those people are uh, Ali Wright, Andrew Lebrano, Asaran, Auna94, Brennan Spalding, Brian Notariani, Buy More Skyrim for Todd, Constantin Amend, Cool Jam, Cosmics360, Daniel Menchez, Das Kangaroo, David Sensor, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Digletier, Ecton, Edward Franklin Woods, Eugene Bulkin, Gaskell, IFR93, Jacob Dylan Riddle, Jinkaloid, Jordan Gear, Kevin Help Us, Luke Kokoran, Mace154, Marika Vladalina Altair, Mark Valant, Meme Dragon, Mika Oi, Nate Graff, NWDD, Oliver Mahofa, Patrick Romberg, Peter Tomasek, Reddit X, Regal Regex, Revelation, Ray's Dad, Silver Fulfi, Steam Rollerman, Steve Riley, Tom Marston, Ty Guren, Tyler Duncan, Uprising, Whimsical Wisp, Zach Brantmeyer, and Chow. Whew, okay, that is all from me. I hope you have a lovely holiday season because some of us have got to get back to work and finish up this damn end of year video. All right, okay, bye.